talking about eDNA in the Salish Sea. Um, before we do that, though, I want to acknowledge that I'm personally joining from the ancestral land of the Coast Salish people today. Um, and often when we're thinking about the roundtables, try and connect the particular topics we're thinking about to how that um, connects with the, the tribal stewardship um, uh, since time immemorial. And so when we think about you know, eDNA, it is one of the many tools that we can use to support tribal treaty rights, um, but also it is a one of the tools that complements indigenous knowledge. And so recognizing there are never silver bullets in our world of science um, and keeping that perspective and that connection in mind as we continue today and other conversations on science um, supporting Puget Sound recovery. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over um, to Ryan. Ryan, if you wanna share your screen and do a quick intro, we will dive right in. Sure, thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> this is it's really a pleasure to be here. I was just looking at all of the all of the names and uh, and faces, and it's it's so much fun. I'm glad to see some familiar people show up, uh, but lots and lots of people that uh, that I don't know. So uh, it's a pleasure. And let me uh, share my screen here. And as I'm getting started, I just want to um, say thank you in particular uh, to Marielle here who is running a, a very professional ship. Uh, what, a, what an incredibly well-run uh, speaker series and uh, well-organized. So thank you for, for all of your efforts, Marielle. Um, I am, I'm gonna jump right in. And the, the, the idea here is to give a little bit of background for people that don't think about environmental DNA all the time, which is obviously the vast majority of people in the world um, and, and give a, a few examples of how we've been using this emerging tool, emerging data source uh, within the Salish Sea and then sort of nearby more generally, um, and then zoom out a little bit and say, well, okay, but great, can I use it in real life? Is it legal? Does it meet my requirements? And then the idea is we'll have uh, sufficient time for a conversation at the end of this. So uh, more than welcome. Any uh, any questions at that point? And um, and I've got like that guesses in the chat. I love this. I hadn't thought about this, Mario, as a like an organizing. Um, you know, it's almost like an icebreaker. You're like, well, how far does DNA travel? Because that's it's a big question that people ask all the time. And so um, I will I will uh, well we'll see if I can answer it to anybody's satisfaction. So um, want to give just a quick. Um, introduction to, uh, so I'm the director of the eDNA Collaborative here at the University of Washington. We are uh, a, a newish um, sort of center, little tiny center, I suppose, uh, just over the last couple of years, we've sprung up. Um, and the idea is to uh, make eDNA more accessible, more, <clears throat> excuse me, more accessible to more people around the world. So we're taking this, hopefully helping to take this data source and um, make it out of the lab into practice uh, around the world. So we we've, we've do this in a bunch of different ways, but uh, largely it's, we're trying to reach out to people uh, in uh, different, different locations. Uh, obviously 40 plus countries, we've now got uh, contacts in, we're awarding small amounts of money and equipment to people uh, all over the world to in particular lower barriers in the global South. Um, so that everybody can sort of join this conversation and really um, a bit of a revolution, I think, in how we see the world. Um, so to me, that's that's really, really exciting. My academic department, uh, my home department here is the School of Marine uh, and Environmental Affairs and um, at least at least one alumna on the call. Hello, Tanya, uh, and maybe maybe others as well. Um, so we are a, a small group of a uh, handful of folks here on the University of Washington campus and just wanna um, introduce that. And that's where a lot of this work is, um, is funneling out of the university, hopefully out into the world. Um, and then a lot of the work that um, I'll be talking about in particular, it's, it's got different people's names attached to it. So nobody, nobody does eDNA work alone um, because it requires a tremendous number of different sort of skill sets. So I wanna acknowledge that up front. Um, and so I, I, love, I love the idea that with environmental DNA is, I, I see it as, um, we're in the really early days of having discovered um, a, like a telescope, let's say, uh, or a microscope if you prefer, that all of a sudden it has become obvious in the last decade or so that everything, all living things um, 
are constantly shedding DNA into the environment. And therefore we're living in a soup of DNA all the time. And we've just used, uh, we've just learned really to be able to pick that information up and use it. It's the most, if you think about it, it's sort of the most information dense um, form of, uh, it's the most information dense signal about the world that you could possibly imagine. Um, the nucleotide sequences of the DNA of all living things just sort of lying around invisibly for us to discover and, and maybe make use of. So to me, that's really, really exciting because it feels like it's this hidden world where we're like peeking under the rug of, um, of what's out there and allows us to see the world in a totally different way than we've ever been able to do before. And so that's why the goal here is like, if you've got a new tool, wouldn't you want to share that with everybody and help them use it? And that's kind of where, where I'm coming from, where we're coming from here at UW. Um, so what is environmental DNA um, is sort of the first basic question. And that is, I, I made reference to this, this idea that we're living in a soup of information. Where does it come from? These are sort of cells that, that everything is constantly giving off. Uh, for single-celled organisms, of course, it's the, it's the whole organism, but for large things, um, it is just individual skin cells or whatever. We go out, we'll grab a bottle of water, uh, typically from the environment. It doesn't have to be water. It can be air. It could be uh, soil. And we filter out the, the environmental medium. In our case, it's usually water. And so we literally are just filtering onto a paper filter, capturing uh, the DNA and everything else on that paper filter. We extract the DNA out of it. Uh, and then we make lots of copies of that DNA. Uh, using PCR, which is the, uh, many of you are familiar with it. In case not, it's essentially just a, a, a way of copying DNA many, many times. So at that point, you then have a, uh, you have a choice to make um, sort of analytically. Do you, what, what kind of an analytical question are you asking? If you're asking a question about a single species where you know what you want to know about one species, um, that's the sort of the lower path here, the quantitative PCR or more recently digital droplet PCR, digital PCR, but a single species assay to say how much of this species DNA is in my particular sample. And you might use that for lots of purposes like is the Chinook salmon above and below this former dam site on the Elwha, for example, um, or is do I see uh, invasive green crab in um, in my, my water sample from Whitby Island or, or wherever, you're, wherever you've got your sample from. So that's, those are examples of single species questions. And in order to answer that question, you would you, you'd make use of a single species assay using usually quantitative PCR or digital PCR. The other branch, the upper branch here is a less well-defined question. Um, it's what we call metabarcoding. It's you're going to amplify DNA with more general primers, and you're going to get information about hundreds or thousands of species uh, that are present in your sample. It's less quantitative, but it gives you a lot more information about the sort of environmental context of what's there. Um, and good news, you don't have to decide either of these exclusively. Once you've extracted your DNA in your tube, um, you can just reuse it. You can re-query that same sample in different ways. And so maybe if five years from now we become concerned with some other species, we can query old samples uh, with new assays and get, get new answers. So in that way, you can sort of look back in time. That, that DNA captured from the environment becomes a little bit of a time capsule that we can reuse down the line. So uh, lots of advantages here that, that in terms of scalability, uh, in, in principle, this is automatable, right? Like paying people to go out and do things like whole humans to do things like drag nets through the water or survey the same sites over and over again is expensive and can be error prone. If you can automate some of that, that becomes, um, you know, we, we can get more information better, faster, cheaper, ideally. And then we focus on the things that humans are really good at, which is sort of understanding the signals that we're looking for in the world. Uh, in particular, the non-invasive uh, nature of this, like we're literally just taking water samples, that can be quite useful, uh, especially in the context of, um, of imperiled species like federally endangered species. You don't want to be touching those. You'd need a lot of permits to even get near them. Instead, we can take water samples. We can know what's nearby. That becomes quite handy. 
Um, and then finally, the sensitivity is is usually a big selling point here, where it turns out we're very bad at looking for like the first fish uh, <laughs> with or the last fish uh, with our eyes. That that our sensitivity of traditional methods, whether it's net or hook and line or whatever method you're using, it's very hard to find things when they're rare because those you know fish or whatever you're interested in, frogs, snakes, whatever. They can hide really well, but the DNA can't hide. And so that's why um, that sensitivity, we can take a water sample, we can know what's there without ever having seen the organism. So to me, that's a big selling point. It's very exciting. But it's also one of those things that makes people nervous because they're like, wait, if you didn't see with your eyes, how do you know it was really there? And we can talk more about that, but I think there are lots of good answers to that question. So. Moving on, um, this is what I what I picked. I started making this talk and I realized that this talk could not be three hours long. So I could not talk about all the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, but I'm highlighting a few examples here, invasive species detection, fisheries management, uh, secret dolphins as promised and widely advertised now. Uh, and then this question of like, is it legal? And under how 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 do we start thinking about that in a in a from the perspective of, of administrative agencies. Many of you work for state agencies uh, that have sort of similar questions. Uh, what I'm not talking about is a bunch of other work that we're engaged in, endangered species monitoring. We have a new rockfish project in Puget Sound, uh, looking at yellow eye rockfish in particular using eDNA. Uh, salmon culverts, we've wrapped up that work um, academically, but I suspect it's just now scaling up because um, if you've got a tool that will tell you where the salmon are, um, both for sort of which streams salmon live in, but also upstream and downstream of culverts, that becomes a really useful tool if you're, say, Department of Fish and Wildlife. So um, there might be a lot of conversation um, to be had in the future about that, but I'm not touching on that um, in specific today. Uh, harmful algal blooms, we've done this kind of work uh, for some years now in Puget Sound uh, in, in collaboration with the Washington Ocean Acidification Center. And so I'm happy to chat to folks about that as well. Uh, and then more broadly, um, NEPA compliance, environmental impact reporting. This is a tool that is sort of gaining credence uh, internationally. And I think it's gonna start showing up over and over again now in, uh, in NEPA documents in the US. But um, but in order to, I'm focusing mostly on the things here that are in dark rather than things that are in light because just due to limited time. Um, but I wanna, I'm gonna highlight this, this photo here from, um, this is, I think it's from 1947, that after World War II, um, there was this question of like, oh, we've now figured out radar pretty well for, for military purposes. How, how could, should we be using this for civil aviation, for commercial aviation in the United States? And um, that was an open question. And in fact, the pilots union opposed uh, the technology that the use of radar in, um, in commercial aviation in the United States after the war. And um, so I, I sort of find this amazing, one, that it was ever a question, like, should we be using radar uh, for air, airline safety? And two, that it was opposed. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm flagging this because I think it's an interesting question at the dawn of a new technology, seeing it um, sort of diffused throughout society and asking what's it good for and, um, and what technologies come to the fore, get adopted and become like, well, of course we use that. Like, would you get on an airplane without radar? Um, versus like when, when it's brand new, it's, it can be sort of a, an open question and, and even controversial. So um, I'm positioning eDNA in that context. Who knows if it becomes the radar of the future or just another data source that, you know, it's like, you know, okay, it's just another net. Cool. Like that may or may not be useful in some situations. Um, but i I'm just trying to sort of highlight that. I think that's where we are. We are early days, um, but exciting days. So to jump in, this is um, one of my favorite first examples here. This is Abby Keller's uh, work. And Abby was a master's student of mine here at the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs. And she did this work deep pandemic, or we did this work together, but she did the field work deep pandemic Everything had shut down. Uh, she couldn't really, she was the only person who could be in the lab. You could have one person in the lab at a time. And Abby really uh, took this ball and ran with it in a very cool way. So as many of you know, the European green crab is invasive uh, in the Salish Sea, probably as all of you know. Um, and it, it has moved over time. And so in the center figure, this is the line where it had invaded to or had been found by 1999, then by 2012, 2020, when Abby made the figure, um, 2021 maybe. And um, so she went around to these sites that are marked with circles and 
uh, she collected bottles of water next to the traps where DFW or close to the traps where DFW had set out many, many traps. And they spent a lot of time and effort trapping green crab to know where they are and to get rid of them. Many of you, you might actually be those people, some of you. So <clears throat> what most people um, in eDNA studies, the sort of first question is like, does the, does the DNA result look just like the result I get in my trap? And so the, res the, the end product of that kind of analysis is this figure on the left, which you'll get something like this, or sometimes it's a Venn diagram, but it's the same idea that it's like, did I see the crabs with both traps and eDNA? That's the purple. Or just eDNA? That's the yellow. Or um, and in fact, in this case, there was no example where they'd gotten trapped green crab, but no. Uh, eDNA, um, but you might imagine that as another outcome. And then, no, I didn't. And then neither of these methods detected the crab. So that's a very common end product, but it's a little bit unsatisfying, right? Because you're like, well, okay, I have two tools that are telling me something about the world, and they're giving me slightly different signals. They're, um, they, they disagree somewhat, right? Like these yellow places uh, found DNA of green crabs, but no actual green crabs in the traps. So what do you do with that information? Um, and what Abby, Abby and I sort of embarked in this, uh, in this, on this adventure, we created a joint model that had formally equated the eDNA detections and the trapping methods saying, okay, all methods of sampling are, are, are imperfect, right? They're gonna, they have a failure rate. They have an error rate of a false positive and a false negative rate, if you like to think of it that way. So let's make a mathematical model that says both the traps and the eDNA are imperfect, but they're both estimating some common reality. Um, that is the true density of crabs. And that's what's presented in this middle panel, that crab density per, this is crabs per trap equivalent, um, uh, based on the combined information from traps and eDNA. And so by combining them, um, we get better, we get greater certainty uh, on what lives where. And the most interesting ones here, the most interesting sites here, were the ones that are beyond this line. So it's um, it's two places in uh, Vashon Island where they'd never seen an adult green crab. Very likely, where the DNA was coming from was 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 larvae, right? So in this case, first of all, eDNA is a little bit more sensitive than green crab. But second, by doing a mathematical model like this, we can put them on a common sort of playing field. They can talk to the kinds of data, can talk to each other and come to some consensus. Um, and what seems to be the case here is that the DNA is probably picking up larvae and it's, it's showing you where, where the, the invasion is likely to go next. And to me, that's really exciting. That is it, is it useful? I think that that's the conversation of like, what do you then do with that information? Um, but it's certainly providing new information. And that's where Abby then uh, created this uh, simulation on the bottom right, this pink uh, diagram. This tells you, this is the change in uh, the coefficient of variation. So if th as this number is higher, that is the more marginal value DNA is providing when you add it to a data set. Um, and this makes sense because as you, if you've got a lot of traps in the water already, you don't need eDNA. You already have a lot of information about whether green crabs are present or not. Right. That's so eDNA is not providing any marginal information there. But if you have very few traps or zero traps in the water, any information eDNA is providing is is of marginal benefit, uh, is a, is a marginal um, increase in your information that that you're taking home. And then um, the the benefit of the information also depends in some way on how common the crabs are, right? Because when crabs are really really common, you'll catch them in your first trap that's out there. So. Again, eDNA is not providing any additional information there that you might want to add. But she, Abby created this figure as a sort of guide to thinking about when it is and is not rational uh, in, to, to augment your existing monitoring program with eDNA. And you, she's actually created a, an R uh, shiny application for managers where you can go actually play with this on the web and say, oh, well, my situation is slightly different. Here's the kind of information I have. Is it worth my time to go look for DNA? So I love this example just because the thoroughness with which uh, she took it on, and it's it's obviously a local Salish Sea example. Um, this, I should say, is a qPCR assay. This is a single species assay for uh, green crabs. And then if we, um, so this then in the, in the context of fisheries, um, 
this is a couple of different kinds of information. So on the left is a single species assay, on the right is a multi-species assay. And I wanna just talk about these uh, separately for a moment. The one on the left, many of you uh, may have seen this figure before. This is from um, a paper that got a lot of attention um, the, the, toward the end of 2022, about a year and a half ago, um, that Ole Shelton, friend and colleague, published this. And this is the NOAA Hake cruise along the West Coast. So every other year, NOAA sends out ships and they do an acoustic trawl survey. What this is, is they shoot out um, sound waves and look at the reflection, what bounces back and tries to count the biomass of hake, um, uh, important commercial fishery, based on those acoustic signals. Um, and they augment the, the acoustic signals with a, an actual sort of net um, to, fig to you know, figure out what the composition of, of things that's in the water is. And this is a massive, massive effort. And so they, they take the boat every other summer and they drive these transects up and down the coast. So every one of these black lines offshore is a transect that NOAA is driving their boat um, every other year. And, and the red dots, that's where we got water samples from. We got water samples from each of five or six depths going down to 500 meters uh, in places where the, where the shelf allows that. So taking discrete bottle samples, and then the idea is to compare it to what NOAA got from their estimates of, of acoustic biomass. Um, and so what, this was the result, Ole did, did a, a fancy mathematical smooth on, on the result. Um, the DNA data actually provides us with three-dimensional information. So we can say where the Hake DNA is in space in three dimensions. <clears throat> that was, this is the summer of 2019, uh, and we have uh, subsequent data uh, every other year since then. But you actually get a three-dimensional picture of where the DNA is. Uh, for this important commercial fishery species. Um, and then the, it, here it's flattened to two dimensions uh, so for ease of showing on the screen. And then on the, on the right-hand panel of this diagram, that's what the, the biomass estimate was for uh, the acoustics alone. And so broadly, they, they agree quite nicely. Um, DNA, though, is developing largely the same information, but in three dimensions rather than two, and using discrete samples and really a, a much smaller sampling effort than the acoustic trawl. So for lots of reasons, NOAA at a federal level is quite excited about this. And there seems every reason to believe this can get folded into um, uh, stock assessments in a, in a really formal way. This is, it's, it's, in fact, the data is even formatted in a way where it, my sense is it can fold into an ensemble model for, for federal stock, um, stock assessments under Magnuson-Stevens, which is how we manage those, those federal fisheries. So what I love about this example is it's taking uh, what in the last, in the, you know, the previous slide, we're talking about a matter of, you know, very small scale, like looking at like within a kilometer, you know, these like little bottle samples next to uh, local trap samples for green crab, and then blowing it up across 10 degrees of latitude to say, oh, look, this works at this massive scale for effectively for counting fish. Um, so that's super exciting. Has really gotten a lot of attention um, within the federal agencies. And I'll come back to that point you know, at, toward the end here. On the right, this is Cara Andres. This is a distinctly non um, Salish Sea example, but I think it's relevant here for this audience. Uh, Cara Andres' work out of Cornell. This is, this is a freshwater example uh, from a lake. And the question is if you're interested in species richness, um, how how shall you go how, how should you go about surveying uh, all the fish in a lake? And so this is a it's actually a cost benefit analysis of uh, fishing to for biodiversity survey for the fish in this lake. What's the optimal combination of gear types to answer your your management question, which is how many species are present? And so here, this is the metabarcoding example. This is not a single species, it's a multi-species sequencing adventure that she embarked upon. Um, and it's a, it's a really impressive paper. I don't have the full citation here, but I'm happy to send it out, that um, <clears throat> you sort of can move these around and say, well, what combination of gear types would give me the most bang for my buck? Uh, in terms of cost, it turns out that about three quarters of your effort would go to eDNA. Uh, in 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 terms of effort, in terms of like actual labor, it's about half. But uh, regardless, eDNA would be 
um, half or more of the of the amount of work you're putting in to uh, efficiently survey this lake for fish. And uh, this is one of, of relatively few papers that have done this cost benefit analysis in a quantitative way. And so I recommend it to folks that are that are curious about that question. But it also gets to this point that um, you're going to see with eDNA, you're going to see more species uh, than you will with any other gear type every time. It doesn't matter if you're counting fish or frogs or whatever. Um, the, whenever people do this analysis of eDNA versus some other pick your method of choice, the eDNA circle is always much bigger than the others. You're always going to see more species with DNA than you will with anything else because it's selectivity uh, is is quite different. And so it's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison when people are, are trying to do that one-to-one -one comparison. And I'm happy to talk uh, more about that if folks like. Um, okay, and then so to get to the dolphin thing, let's see if this, uh, this works. Because the cool thing about starting to work with some oceanographers is you get slides that actually move and it's you could just like, you could just look at the water move all day long. Uh, this is Parker McCready's live ocean model that many of you know and love. I think it's liveocean.com or something very similar to that, but provides this high resolution map of the Salish Sea and in fact forecasting. And so given that this tool exists, we were able to use, um, uh, sort of create this partnership where the US Navy has these secret dolphins <clears throat> that aren't that secret, but they won't let us take photos of the ones here. This is a photo of the dolphin facility in Southern California and San Diego, but uh, the one in the Hood Canal looks not too dissimilar from this. And we've got uh, some number of dolphins, of, um, but the, the key part about these dolphins is that they are Atlantic bottlenose dolphins. They are not native species. So they're the only Atlantic bottlenose dolphins, to my knowledge, within like hundreds of kilometers. So when we see bottlenose dolphin DNA in the Salish Sea, I know exactly where it came from. And we've got this live ocean model. So we know pretty much exactly where the water's moving at any given time. So this allows us to set up a set of, a series of experiments where we've got this, what we're treating as a megacosm, basically, a high resolution oceanographic model and systematic eDNA sampling to ask questions like, well, how far does the DNA go? And what does the degradation look like in time? And ultimately the goal is to work backwards and say, well, given an observation in the world, where were the animals and when? Uh, and that's a hard math problem, but we have very smart people working on it. So that's it's very exciting. So this is funded through, as I said, the US Navy uh, as part of their marine mammal uh, research. And th this is what this looks like uh, sort of in practice. First, we had to downscale uh, the live ocean model and it, it looks like this and it's downscaled to 10 to 20 meter resolution. Um, we know the dolphins are at Bangor, uh, which is no, a known site on the map. And so you could do article tracking experiments uh, as Jillian Zhang has done a lot of. This is a manuscript that is just recently accepted for publication where she can drop you know, different numbers of virtual particles saying here, let's assume the dolphin was here. Where did the DNA go? over the course of 24 hours or 48 hours. And then the, the heat map tells you about the virtual particles and where they ended up. This has given us a predictive model to know where the DNA went. And we can actually go out in a boat and, and test that. And, um, and then those, that becomes an interaction between the model and the data. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's uh, the very first, you are among the first people to see this slide. And um, this is, Early, early results here, but uh, driving a boat around um, the Hood Canal, this is in the northern part of the Hood Canal, over the course of, um, I don't know, six hours or so, keeping track of the tides and where we were very precisely, uh, we, can, we can sample, uh, amplify the dolphin DNA out of it. Again, this is a single species assay that, that we were using. And then we can compare that in a quantitative way to uh, what we would have predicted from that particle tracking model. And here was Jillian's first attempt at such a plot. What jumps out at you uh, is the, the here the gray bars are the amount of DNA uh, that we actually observed in terms of copies uh, per microliter of, of dolphin DNA. That's the gray, gray bars. And then uh, the lines are the particle tracking simulation, how, how much DNA the model per, um, projected would be there under a couple of different scenarios. And these are different rates of DNA syncing. This is the red one is turning off DNA syncing entirely. 
And so what you immediately notice is where the model predicts most of the DNA it would be is, is where we found the largest concentration of the DNA. Where the model predicts zeros, uh, we found zeros. Where the model predicts some intermediate, uh, we find some intermediate value. It's a, so it's an extraordinarily good uh, correlation. And now just working up, sort of finalizing that and submitting that for publication. But a pretty cool um, thing to do to be able to sort of work backwards and say, how this is a physics based model like how is the dna behaving like a passive particle in the world yes it seems like it is and it seems like we we can actually have a very good idea of, of where the dna comes from where it goes and um when when and where we can expect to pick it up <clears throat> and the next step then is to do that backwards to say okay given that we've observed it where was the animal and that's harder but now we have a very good sort of framework with which to um, to do that analysis so in answer to the question of how far does dolphin DNA travel, of course, many of there were a bunch of guesses that I saw on the screen earlier. And of course, some of you said, well, it depends. Well, of course, that, you know, that's always the answer in ecology, isn't it? Like, it, of course it depends. Um, and so I, I will say that we don't think of it as an either or thing, right? That there's, we think of it as a concentration with like a, a probability of detection over space and time. And so um, this is uh, like your probability of detection drops drastically uh, after the first few hundred meters. Um, you can detect it to a kilometer or two or three away, but it's rare. Um, so, but it's on the order of, let's say a kilometer or maximum 10 kilometers is that order of magnitude. And that's actually shorter than everybody's guess that I saw before starting this talk. So DNA is going not very far. And it's also not lasting very long. The half-life of DNA is about 24 hours in the real world, 24 to 48 hours. The DNA gets shed by the organism. Much of it sinks, and so it depends on where you're sampling. But microbes in the water are constantly eating stuff, and so the degradation of the DNA goes is, is, is on the order of, of hours to days, but certainly not weeks. So that gives us a mental image of what we can expect uh, in terms of interpreting signals that we see in the world, when we grab water, we sequence DNA out of it, we, we see a species that we care about, we have pretty high confidence that that organism was there within, you know, a, one to 10 kilometers and within a day or so. So it's pretty much here and now. And that's, I think that's, that can cut both ways, right? Like as a, as a monitoring tool, um, you got to know what you're picking up and wh what what your scale of resolution is. And I think that's that's the growing consensus of that is our scale of resolution. Um, whether or not that's useful for your particular management application, that's a different question. Um, and it's going to depend on what what you're counting and why. Um, but that's I think so that's my answer. Um, knowing that it's of course, there's not one answer, but it's a continuum, uh, but your probability of detection drops drastically after the first few hundred meters and the first day. <laughs> so then uh, to, to pivot substantially, I wanted to dedicate uh, just a little bit of time here to asking a, a very practical question, right? Because people, lots of scientists say lots of things, right? <laughs> like things come out of the university all the time. That doesn't make it, that doesn't make it useful. And in particular, it doesn't mean that it meets the requirements that people have in doing their jobs. So whether you work at a federal agency or a state agency or a private company or whatever it is, like you have some non-discretionary duty that you're carrying out over the course of your day. And if eDNA is a useful tool that helps you do that job better, cheaper, faster, and in a way that you can stand behind uh, that in, in so far as it's reliable, um, Great. And if not, then not. Then you're obviously not going to make use of this because because uh, it doesn't it's not speaking to a need that you have. So we spent um, a bunch of time digging through available court documents and literature and such uh, and ended up publishing this paper last year. Eric Lashiver, uh, who is a environmental attorney in the in the region, um, was the lead author on this paper in the Columbia Environmental Law Journal last year. Um, our, that was our question was, does eDNA meet legal requirements? How are, how are our federal agencies currently using eDNA as a data source? And um, we didn't look so much at state agencies, um, but it is, I think there are very close analogs across different states, uh, particularly in Washington um, and in California. 
But so short answer here is eDNA, as far as the federal agencies are concerned, is just another data type. Like it's it's not different than data that you would get from dragging a net through the water or data from remote sensing from your satellite. It's just another data stream. There's no reason to treat it differently um, in any regard, right? It doesn't get more credence and it doesn't get less credence. It's, it's just another way of counting things in the world, which to me is probably right where we want to be. That seems just about exactly right. Um, so with that, what the, what, what leads me to that conclusion is the following evidence. So number one, in court, it has, eDNA has come up a couple of times in federal court. Uh, the big one that many of you may know about, this is the Army Corps case where um, different species of carp from Asia, invasive species of carp, were threatening to get into the Great Lakes and still are. Um, this has resulted in a massive ongoing eDNA sampling campaign around the freshwater bodies going toward the Great Lakes, um, and it resulted in actually multiple court cases. Um, in those, both in 2007 and in 2010, the citation that's here, eDNA is, is ruled admissible in court as, as evidence in that federal court. And so to me, that's really useful as a data point to say, even as far back as 2007, the court was willing to say, well, sure, the data is admissible. Um, we may or may not act on it, but it's just another piece of information. Um, and then in the, so that's in the context of invasive species. In the context of endangered species, this is another sort of key use case because endangered species by definition are rare. And so they're often hard to find. It's not clear whether a species may be present or absent at a site. And that matters when you're listing or delisting a species under the US Endangered Species Act. So uh, here, Appalachian Voices, that was the paper, that was the, um, court case that dealt with, I believe, the Roanoke Log Purge there in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and that the um, Department of the Interior, that is Fish and Wildlife Service, makes a, de a decision in part on the basis of eDNA data, um, and it gets challenged and is upheld in court at the Fourth Circuit. So those are our two court cases where um, we can sort of point to eDNA data. It is two for two in federal court, or three for three if you're counting the Army Corps, uh, two different versions of that case. Uh, and then at the on the administrative side of things, the executive branch, um, you have actually now a bunch of examples of these where Fish and Wildlife and NOAA are starting to rely on eDNA data in making, uh, in rulemakings. And uh, most notably in that Endangered Species Act, critical habitat designation or listing. Um, and so uh, several examples of that, but my favorite is the Black Warrior Water Dog listing, which was the first. This is the Black Water Warrior Water Dog, which is not a dog, but a salamander. Um, so very exciting. That has held up in court and um, continues to be just, you know, this is just another data point. So um, to me, that making eDNA boring is a key part of, that's a, that's a goal, right? You want your data types to be boring. You want them to be uh, reliable, dependable. You want to know what to expect from them. And with eDNA, uh, it, on the one hand, it's really exciting in that it's revolutionizing how we see the living world. On the other hand, it's increasingly boring as we can come to trust that and know what to expect from those analyses. That's great. I think that's exactly where we want to be. Um, and so in the last couple of minutes here, before we open this up for conversation, where does this leave us in terms of what's on, what's on the horizon? And um, I've been involved in, in this effort among many people um, government, academic, private sector, NGOs, all kinds of folks um, trying to move toward a national strategy for the United States so that different federal agencies, at least, are implementing eDNA analyses in at least consistent ways with each other. And that's a big ask because at last count, there were something like 22 different federal agencies engaged in this kind of work. So, um, but this was our academic piece that came out last year. And now, uh, there is, in fact, a, a real national eDNA strategy that will be rolled out in the next month by the White House Office of Science Technology Policy that uh, Jane Lubchenco is heading um, the OSTP. And so there is now um, a, an actual eDNA strategy uh, at the national level that is going to land in the next few weeks. And um, we don't know exactly what that will say because there's this sort of division between federal and non-federal people engaged in the effort. So the non-feds, which includes me, haven't seen the actual text yet, 
Um, but to me, this is a really big marker because it's saying um, at the federal level, like number one, this is a this is a thing, and we should be using it, and we should be using it consistently across agencies, and hopefully. Um, this starts to harmonize the adoption of eDNA across these different agencies, and that makes it easier at the state level or at the you know very local level or at, in academia to sort of know what analytical decisions um, might be might be advantageous uh, or not. So best practices, uh, sort of harmonizing data types, harmonizing what to expect out of your eDNA analysis. So that's all very exciting. Um, and I think I can leave it there. I want to say uh, thank you. Look, Nick Nick Adams, I saw your name on the call. There you are uh, on a very wet day in the Hood Canal uh, a while back. But um, as I said, the you know eDNA work, because it involves field work, it involves lab work, it involves bioinformatics, it involves all kinds of um, expertise. Nobody does this alone. And it's um, dozens and dozens of people really should be on this slide. But this was the, the photo I had handy. So um, thank you to these folks and many, many others. Um, and I think I'll stop there and, and take questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, if folks want to either drop questions into the chat, or if you want to raise your hand, we can unmute you. Um, I While folks are thinking and maybe getting that pressed, I am going to also just drop in the link for our roundtable next month um, on June 4th which will look at marine protected areas. We'll also have a happy hour at Seven Seas Brewery and Tap Room in Tacoma as we've been bopping our way around the region for each of those quarterly ones. Um, I think to start, Ryan, you kind of touched on this a little bit in terms of the half-life of detectable DNA. Um, there was a specific question about in the sediment and kind of unique contexts where inside of a tooth or an anaerobic deposit, how that might change the, the detection capacity. Yeah, it's a great question. And now I can, now that I've stopped sharing, I can see in the chat and um, looks like Benjamin Harrison asked uh, one version of this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously these are details that are going to matter, right? Like how is it simultaneously possible that the half-life of DNA in the Salish Sea is 24 hours, but we can pull DNA out of a mammoth from the Pleistocene in Siberia. Like those are hard things to hold in your head at the same time. So obviously the, the environment matters a lot. And yeah, I think there is good evidence that um, DNA that is bound to particles in the sediment lasts much longer. Um, I don't have the sort of chapter and verse on that in, in my head at the moment, but um, yeah, uh, certainly that it, that seems to be true. Certainly temperature plays a big role. And we think that's mediated by by microbes, by essentially microbial metabolism, where uh, in warmer waters, DNA degrades much, much faster. In the kinds of temperatures we see here, this seems to be, um, you know, that, that like one day rule of thumb, uh, one to two days seems like it holds pretty well across many different taxa. But um, your mileage may vary uh, depending on if you're in the tropics, it's going to be a much shorter time frame. Uh, if you're in the Arctic, it's possible it'll be much longer. And if certainly if you're bound to sediment, it, it's likely to be uh, much longer. Um, and then to many other sort of detailed questions here about uh, matrix of how, how what your filter size is and how much you're, you know, how you're doing your DNA extraction, whatever. We found that all of that, it certainly matters, um, but it doesn't matter that much. <laughs> it's, uh, so it sort of depends on what level of detail um, you're interested in. And we, we probably have that conversation offline, but um, happy to chat. Awesome. And we've got a question from Steve Todd about the European green crab example and whether or not eDNA was detected at all locations where crabs were trapped, just confirming that that's what he saw on the map. I, be I believe that is true. Yes. Yeah, there was there was no that example, that study had no false negatives. If you want to define a false negative that way, like we saw it in the trap and did not see it in the DNA that that did not happen in that study. Um, there's a much longer conversation to be had about what we mean by false positive and false negative when all, all forms of our information are imperfect about the world. But um, yeah, confirming that. Great. Thank you. And I guess, Ryan, just to the, the two different options in terms of testing, um, obviously the question drive, that you're looking to answer drives that, but for giving folks a, a frame of reference, what does cost look like? 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> that gets asked a lot and is in, um, I mentioned that Kara Andre's paper, um, mm -hmm. there is um, um, Kevin's paper from Kevin Lafferty's paper uh, in Southern California just came out on an endangered species, the Tidewater goby, Eucyclogobius nuberia. Uh, I can find that link if you're interested. Uh, he had a recent paper uh, doing cost, sort of cost analyses. And there, I don't have one answer for you because everybody does this differently. It's like, do you count the cost of the people time? Like the people time is by far the most expensive th time of any project. But usually when people write down their costs, that, that gets excluded. Um, so it also depends a lot on whether you already have a molecular lab. Like, do you have your own molecular lab? Do you have your own DNA sequencer? Then it becomes much cheaper. But like, do you, like most people don't have their own molecular lab. So um, I think for, for me, it's a useful thing to say that for any given sample, if you outsource that analysis, so you take a bottle of water and then you outsource most of the work to a third party, and there are many um, eDNA services companies that have sprung up, dozens of them now, um, you're probably looking at $75 to $100 per sample uh, for sequencing analysis. So to get back a, sequence, uh, a set of DNA sequences from a sample, that's a ballpark of what you might expect. Thank you. That's always helpful to have a, a magnitude to start from. I also yeah. see in the chat a question about eDNA-friendly curriculum or activities for high schoolers that either Ryan, you, or others on the call want to share. You know, I don't have, If I'd love to hear if anybody does have that. I don't have anything uh, teed up. Oh, second alumna, Ray, hi. Um, I don't have anything teed up, uh, but I know that uh, Joe Rosano at the Salmon School is working closely with uh, Tacoma at the ports and the, the um, public uh, school district of Tacoma, uh, Seattle Public, uh, Tacoma Public Schools uh, to move eDNA into the classroom in the the salmon in the classroom um you know how they like raise salmon in classrooms and then release them uh in what's got to be one of the more endearing pacific northwest uh curricular elements uh now that has some eDNA associated with it in tacoma and so i would expect that there there is a curriculum that goes along with that um so that would be one place to look you know there's another one out of new york out of uh, long island um, out of the Cold Spring Harbor um, labs, they have uh, an extensive set of of curricula around eDNA. And in fact, they have an online eDNA like bioinformatics portal called uh, eDNA Subway uh, that's themed, you know, obviously uh, on the New York City subway. Um, but it's it's user friendly and it is it's meant to be for I think for high school students. So that's that's another example. Great. Um, Thank you. Question about citizen science opportunities, and actually, the Green Crab project started as a citizen science thing, and then the um, the pandemic totally shut down. Uh, obviously, everything, uh, but certainly shut down that element of it. So there, I don't know of an ongoing, like <clears throat> routine citizen science monitoring project that uses eDNA um, immediately in the Salish Sea. I do know um, there is one that is uh, across the different. Uh, National Estuarine Research um, Reserves, NERS, um, and that's run out of the University of New Hampshire. Allison Watts has that, and uh, Padilla Bay, for example, is one of the NERS. And so I think they do have citizen science monitoring out of that. Um, but the Green Crab folks, Crab team here at, at um, Washington Sea Grab, I think they, they've got a big citizen science uh, element of that uh, Green Crab monitoring project. And I think if they wanted to add EDA to it, they'd be interested in doing that. Uh, so that's one example. Um, interested in, um, oh, Steve Todd is interested in electrofish versus eDNA detection. And that gives me... Um, Oh, and Jamie Glass. I know all these people. Well, many of them. Hi. Um, <laughs> so to Steve's, um, he's saying he's interested for, for single target species, electrophores versus eDNA detection and quantification. And this is a perfect time for me to sort of pitch this idea that um, that we've, we have really imperfect tools of, of seeing the world. And so electrofishing is state of the art uh, in, in some context. Um, but I think people engaged in electrofishing, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, 
will will tell you that it's that it is it is imperfect like right that there is there is a failure rate to that or or rather you're missing a lot of things um there are pros and cons and same thing with eDNA that it's not perfect this is not a tool that will like solve climate change single-handedly or make you breakfast this is a thing where it's it's providing it's a new tool a new way of seeing the world it works great in lots of ways it, it's got drawbacks in other ways and often people want to do this one-to-one -one comparison and it's like one imperfect thing and another imperfect thing. And like, they don't line up. <laughs> you won't get the same answer. And um, I, I just want to put a plug in, in here for this group, because this is exactly the target audience for that kind of analysis, that like that analysis is a bit is misleading because you're taking an imperfect thing and matching it to another imperfect thing, but they're imperfect in like in different ways. So of course they don't correlate. <laughs> like, um, and so the thing to do is to say, look, each of like how we put this information together to make a, a, a more robust whole. And that's what Abby did in the case of the green crab. Or if the question is, can I replace my existing technology with this new one? What does that handoff look like? Like, what is that crosstalk? Um, what should that be? How would I convince myself that this is really working in a way that means that I don't have to depend on this existing um, the other way that I was doing it before. So yeah, Steve, I'm, I'm happy to chat and I'll, um, I don't know how to capture this information, but, uh, I will, I will this send down. it to you afterwards. So you <laughs> do not need to capture it in real time. <laughs> and I was going to say, we've got uh, also a couple of questions in the Q and a portion and in the chat about just the species abundance component of this, um, and kind of where that's at and um, in particular, this idea that with trapping, there's limitations in terms of CPU, but whether or not there's a metric to compare to for eDNA. Sure, yeah, great question. And it always comes up and <clears throat> with, so yeah, the obvious answer is it depends, but like that's not really satisfying to anybody. So the better answer I think is number one, here's what we know. We know that where there are more, where there's more of a species, there's more of its DNA, like full stop. So where a thing is rare, its DNA will be very rare. Um, and so the, as like an end end members of a, of, a, of, of a continuum, those things are quite certain. What's also quite certain is there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between, you know, number of fish in the water and number of DNA molecules in the water. So what the shape of that curve is of relating biomass or abundance to eDNA capture is going to depend on a lot of things. And I think in a single species assay, it's much more straightforward. Like you can do that experiment, you can draw that curve and it works okay. Um, in a multi-species context, what people want to do is say, oh, the proportion of DNA sequences I get back is related to the biomass of my species of interest. And that turns out not to be true. The reason it turns out not to be true is that metabarcoding data, in a, it's a multi-species thing, all those are, those, oh, those are proportions. Those estimates of different species DNA, those are proportions and they're not independent of one another. So that when one thing, one species amplifies really, really well, Everything else gets squished, even if they were amplifying just just as well as you know before. They they amplify one percent less well than the thing that amplifies really well, and then all of a sudden your proportions have no no relationship to your reality. And the solution to this is to calibrate your metabarcoding study, so that if you can if you can know how well each of your species of interest is amplifying with your with your PCR primers, you can correct for that, and that gets you out of that problem. Um, so yes, there are very real ways forward linking abundance to, to eDNA, to metabarcoding in the multi-species context. In fact, we've got a, a paper right now um, in review that, that does this and actually uh, compares to, to trawls um, in the North Sea and can predict catches in trawls quite well from, um, from molecular data, but, um, but it, it requires a lot of work. So I think, the take home there is that it's not a straightforward relationship, but there, there is an abundance signal that is very real, but it's not a straightforward one. And so you gotta be willing to do a bunch of math. Um, and I think, like I said, early days and where that math becomes easier as we get tools to do that. But um, for the moment, I would just say, certainly where there are more of a thing, there's more of its DNA, where there's less of it, there's less of its DNA. And um, in a single species context, 
that relationship can be um, is much more knowable at the moment. Great. I think last question we'll take here is um, about how far away we are from getting results while still on site. So field based analysis and kind of the, the evolution of the technology there. Yeah, uh, great question. I think for single species analysis, that's that's very doable now. Um, if it really matters to you, that you could be in the field getting results in near real time. That is achievable uh, if if what you're interested in is a single species analysis. So the way you could do that, there are several groups working on it. We we went down that road um, a little bit, and. Uh, ultimately ended up handing it off to UC Davis because they they had a head start and they're very good. Uh, Andrea Schreier's lab there was developing real-time assays, is developing real-time assays for various salmonids and uh, the Delta smelt in the California Delta, which is endangered. Uh, and then you can, you can do, um, there was a new assay out of Washington State University last month for Chinook uh, that you can put on a lateral flow strip. So it looks like a COVID test and you can, um, and you can see, like, is my am I positive for COVID or is my river positive for Chinook? Um, so I think that is doable. Um, relatively few people actually want very real time information. Like, it are you going to make a decision that's different on the basis of that lateral flow strip, like right now? Um, and so, what the people in the private sector have told us is that that generally end users are unwilling to pay for real-time information because they're not gonna act on it right away. They'd rather do batch do batches of samples, send them to the lab and get all the data back at once. Um, so I don't know where, where people are on that spectrum, but if you wanna be able to do that, you can do that. In terms of sequencing in the field, uh, Oxford Nanopore is the company that, that sells its DNA sequencer as doing DNA sequencing anywhere in the world. Um, it's in reality, not feasible for most people in most places in the world. So I think that's a work in progress. But again, I'm not actually sure you need, do you need like thousands and thousands of species worth of DNA sequence information while you're standing there in the field? I don't know, maybe you do. And if so, you know, we could work along those lines, but we haven't found a use case for that yet. Thanks, Ryan. I always appreciate the connection between both what is possible and what decisions it's informing, because um, we can build a lot of things that may not be as applicable in the real world. So uh, great context on that. Um, as we wrap up, just want to shout out Jamie for definitely having the closest guests on the um, the eDNA traveling for dolphins. So Jamie, if you are at the next uh, happy hour on June 4th, let me know. I will make sure to get you um, some treats there. And then honorable mention goes out to Steve Todd and um, Linnea uh, for It Depends because in the world of science, that is very often true. But thank you all for joining today for an insightful conversation from dolphin DNA to just uh, the applications more broadly. Excited to see how this continues to evolve um, and the conversations that this sparks. So thank you. Great, and thank you for hosting. What a great event. My pleasure. All right. Take care, all.